Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Medicine online webinar series. Today, Johns Hopkins Chief of Colon and Rectal Surgery, Dr. Bashar Safar and Tam Warzinski, nurse practitioner and multidisciplinary clinic coordinator, will be speaking about novel solutions, personalized treatment through rectal cancer multidisciplinary clinic. Before we get started, we'd like to provide some user tips so that you are comfortable using this platform. The first 30 minutes of our program will include an informative presentation by our presenters. The last 30 minutes will be dedicated to our live Q&A session. Please note this program is being recorded. To submit a question, please type your question into the Q&A box and click send. Your questions will be seen by others watching this presentation, so please note if you do not want your name attached to your question, please check sent anonymously. Also, your email address will be not with any third parties. We will do our best to answer all questions we receive during the Q&A session. Alternatively, you can email us questions and feedback to hopkinsseminars at jhmi.edu. At the end of the webinar, we would greatly appreciate receiving your feedback and ask that you complete the survey. A pop-up window will appear at the end of your program for you to complete the survey. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Bashar Safar to begin our presentation. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. Welcome everybody to uh, our session, uh, discussion on rectal cancer. Really would like to make this interactive as much as possible. We will keep our um, part of the presentation again to a minimum. We just wanna give you some updates as to what's going on at Johns Hopkins, what's possibly new in the treatment of uh, rectal cancer and, and what uh, exciting avenues there are that are going on here at Johns Hopkins. So rectal cancer or colorectal cancer is one of the commonest cancers uh, in the country or in the world. Um, here at Hopkins, we have a specialized rectal cancer team and I'll go into that a little bit later. Why is rectal cancer different from colon cancer? Historically, the rectum um, is associated with, with cancer in the rectum is associated with high risk of disease coming back in the rectum. So local recurrence is a problem because of the area that you're operating in. It's usually sort of confined between the vessels and the bone. And um, again, trying to remove the tumor and, and have a low recurrence rate, as well as preserving the patient's function have been our challenges. What remains to be uh, solved at this point, I think we've got the local recurrence situation almost down. We still have it as a small problem, but not as big as it used to be. Um, and now really we um, uh, sort of have much better protocols and, 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 and standardized treatment methods that the, the thing that we would like to achieve is obviously better survival and the function is still remains if you do have to have big surgery, uh, a challenge uh, today. So traditionally, if you look back in the 1980s and before that surgery for rectal cancer was associated with up to 30% local recurrence rate. Um, and in, in what we do know is in specialized units such as ours, it's always been lower. You know, it was 10 to 20% in these days, and it was up to 40% for rectal cancer done by general surgery practice. You know, it's a practitioner that doesn't specialize in colon rectal surgery or surgical oncology. Most of these recurrences come back within the first two years. This is a study uh, back from early 80s looking at rectal cancer recurrences in the 70s, and this is one of the most premier institutions in the country at MGH, and the local recurrence in the advanced tumors was up to 50%. Now, um, I will go into some of this details and the data and why. We, as a specialty, were able to drop the local recurrence rate to, um, um, to about 4%, 5% by just better surgery. A gentleman called Heald, he was a surgeon in the UK, um, started doing the procedure in, some, you know, in a fashion called total mesorectal excision, where we just stay right outside a certain field or a plane, and we do not violate it, and we're very careful in doing the dissection, and that really reduced the local recurrence rate from what I mentioned to you, 20, 30% down to single digits. Um, and that unit, which is a very specialized unit, also um, showed that you can have the surgery and have a very low colostomy rate. What influences local recurrence really is how wide the tumor is going and you know, how close it is to the bone or is it to the bladder or you know, uh, vagina in women, prostate in men, is to what dictates this. And if you have a circumferential margin that's positive, so when you take out the tumor and it's, it's touching um, less than five millimeters of the outside, 
then the recurrence rate is 85%. And if it's negative margin, then the recurrence rate is 3%. And that's really the crux of this operation. And actually, this is also very closely um, associated with, with survival, meaning if you have a positive margin, you have a worse um, survival rate. So this is the, what's happened in the rectal cancer world in terms of historic development. In the, um, in the 80s, the, the, the discussion was, do we give chemo, do we not give chemo? Then as we move to the 90s, um, and then actually some, some post-op radiation, that was sort of 80s. In the 90s, there were large, large trials that were done, mostly in Europe, and, and these names are sort of set the standard really for rectal cancer management. It's the Swedish trial, the Dutch trial, the German trial. And what these trials did is they used radiation preoperatively. And in the, in, the, in the Swedish trial example, it was given as five days only. And the reason why they gave five days is in Sweden, the patients went to specialized centers and it could be hours away from where they lived. So it was actually more almost for convenience to, to deliver the radiation in five days. And what we, have, what, we have, what we know now and what we kind of almost knew then is the radiation given in short period, it's almost the equivalent. You know, so the only goal of giving radiation is to reduce the local recurrence. If you remember one of the biggest challenges when we had disease, disease management early on was high local recurrence. And really all the trials, other than the Swedish one, did not show improved survival, but it shows a significant improvement in the local recurrence, at least half. So even by good surgery, let's say you drop it down to below 10 and you add preoperative radiation and it drops down even more. Now, there are other advantages to radiation that sort of came up as we went down this road is um, some of the tumors disappear, and we'll talk about that. We don't know what to do with those. Um, and then sometimes when it's really close to the sphincter and really low, the radiation can make it shrink and make it a, a way that we can reconnect patients rather than have them a colostomy. So just as a message, the trials were done, and they proved that preoperative radiation reduced local recurrence and can make the tumors disappear or shrink significantly. Then there were trials to show whether the chemotherapy before surgery made a difference. And um, the biggest trial is actually, we're waiting for the results right now, is uh, based in the US. Um, but in general, we believe now, which is the current paradigm and the things that are discussed are over here, this is what I'm talking about, is for patients who present with rectal cancer. And again, a lot of this stuff was debated over the time. So when you look at the Swedish trial or the Dutch trial, the way that we used to stage cancer was with ultrasounds rectal ultrasound. Now, everything is done with an MRI. So we believe if you have an MRI that shows a T3, which is a locally advanced, a little bit larger than we, you know, than the earliest tumors, and if there's any lymph node involvement, we recommend preoperative radiation. The standard of care in the United States is long course, which is five weeks, and then uh, a variety of chemo. And a lot of the larger centers are now moving to delivering more chemotherapy up front. So a, a, a paradigm called TNT, you know, total new adjuvant therapy. You get all your chemo up front, all your radiation up front. And once you get that, then at the end of the treatment, you sort of get restaged and, you know, we see what, what, how the tumor has responded and what management paradigm we go down. So um, again, I just mentioned, I just talked about all this in the 80s. We were talking about... Um, circumferential margin, total mesorectal excision, which is the healed operation, and post-op radiation. In the 90s, we started giving uh, preoperative radiation. One thing that happened in Europe quite a bit earlier than happened here in the US is the establishment of colorectal cancer units, as I mentioned to you in Sweden. They were very highly specialized units that treated patients with colorectal cancer. Now we're developing those, and the rectal cancer multidisciplinary clinic and center of excellence is definitely one of them. And we, we have been doing so at Hopkins for the last three years or so uh, with Tam as help. And, and, and I think we're doing very well. I, I think we're gonna get accredited soon. Uh, we got a visit from the American College of Surgeons and it was very encouraging. Um, so it's just really stand, it just proves that we have, we're doing things um, at Hopkins uh, in, a, in a very much standardized fashion. You know, everybody comes to get the MRI. We have one radiologist that reads all the MRIs we have one pathologist or if they're not there, there's another that reads all the pathology. All the surgeons are involved in there uh, at the discussion, the radiation oncologists are there at the discussion and all of us are present in one place. And actually believe it or not, Zoom has really facilitated this. We, we started it way before Zoom, but Zoom has really facilitated that all of us sit in one room and discuss every patient. Um, 
And some of the discussions that went on in the 2000s is how often should you be given colostomies or not? Is laparoscopy safe in rectal cancer or is it equivalent? Um, and how busy the surgeon should be or how many rectal cancers should be doing a year for them to be competent. The discussion now, I would say, and I'm happy to take any questions, is organ preservation, meaning if you got chemo and radiation, should you do no surgery and is that safe? Um, there's some of these lymph nodes that are outside of the mesorectum, should we go after them? Um, robotic, is it safe? The watchful waiting. Um, again, if the tumor completely disappears, is it safe to watch patients? Um, short course actually is something that we've been doing at Hopkins for the last three or four years. It was debatable. Many, many, many centers now went to it, especially with COVID, because it, you know, you're getting the radiation in an abbreviated fashion. It's five days, so it's much more convenient for patients in terms of exposure to the healthcare, not necessarily even traveling a far distance, but just going to the hospital. So um, this is just some remarks about traditionally traditional short course. Um, surgeons, some surgeons feel like it makes the surgery a little bit more difficult, you know, a little bit more bleeding. In our experience, we don't believe that that's the case and that it doesn't allow for the tumor to shrink. And again, I can show you our data and I can show you some, some very large data that was recently published, it's called the Rapido trial, that shows that's not the case. Um, this, is a, um, this is our data here at Johns Hopkins. So uh, we started this, again, I think in 2016 or 17, we give it a five days of radiation and then we were giving Folfox. Folfox is the full dose chemotherapy. Um, and our protocol and the paradigm changed actually over time. Initially, we were doing two months of chemo and then getting a uh, staging after, which is an MRI and a flexible sigmoidoscopy. Then we went to three months and we were staging on chemotherapy in case we wanted to continue the chemotherapy. Now we've actually gone further and basically we're recommending what was published recently in a trial called Rapido, which is the entire chemotherapy up front. So five by five, a week or two rest, you get the chemotherapy, and then we restage you. You get flexible sigmoidoscopy and an MRI. This is early experience that we had. This is our early experience. And the one thing I wanna draw your attention to is this red number. Really 46% of our patients, and maybe that's a little generous. I mean, I would say maybe 30 to 40% of our patients, the tumor disappeared. Some patients still prefer to go to surgery, still prefer to go to surgery, so seven of the 20 who were treated, actually their rectum was removed, but then they had pathologic complete response, which means there was no tumor left. That's actually great news normally. I mean, you know, because even though you've been put through surgery, but the likelihood of recurrence and is very low. And the likelihood of cure is very high. Um, but we've had six that we watched that, uh, in that group, and one of them came back. So Again, the, the, when, when you do watch tumors, um, when you do this watchful waiting, th there is um, a risk of recurrence. It's debated between 25 and 30%. And also we feel that there, what, if the ones that do come back might be a little bit more aggressive tumors, um, and there's a high risk of liver involvement you know, when it comes back. Now, I mean, not involvement, but spread. Now, was it, that, was it because the tumor from the beginning was more aggressive? Really, it's impossible to tell. And we don't today know or have a good indicator for who, um, who recurs and who doesn't. So that we, I'm happy to take this discussion offline, but I just wanted to mention some of the things that we're, we're, we're doing at Hopkins and some of these debatable issues in the country. This is the Rapido trial. It was published this year, actually. This was a really well done trial, essentially doing what we were doing. They were giving five by five, and followed by uh, uh, chemo. They gave all the chemo up front. They, came, they gave all the chemo up front. The standard group, they did um, the traditional 25 gray and 5 FU, and then did surgery, and then they did chemo after. The experimental group is basically what I just mentioned to you. And they had a lot of patients that they recruited. Again, remember, there were a lot of centers that were involved in this trial. The experimental group, um, which is the um, which is the group that I just mentioned, the five by five with chemo, they had um, the disease related treatment failure was 
was lower and mostly because there were fewer Mets. And again, that's what we were talking about. We have gotten as much, as good as we get really, or as good as possible in reducing the local recurrence. We, we do the surgery better, we give the radiation. So we feel like that's hard to improve on. But what, it, what the failure a lot of times now is become in distant metastasis. You know, patients come with liver Mets or lung Mets. And, and the feeling is by giving all the chemo up front, we impact this. There was absolutely no difference in the local recurrence rate. If you look at this, it's about 6% to 8%, which is about where we are. And um, the, uh, there was no statistical difference in the distal net. And when you look at the PCR, which is pathologic complete response, pathologic, the tumor's gone. It doubled in the experimental group, which is the group that got the chemo and radiation up front. So we really believe that this is a, a seminal, you know, this, this paper is, is, is practice changing. We believe that the way we've been doing things is justified. And this is actually lends more sort of support uh, to, to what we've been doing at Hopkins for a few years. This was uh, a paper that we wrote recently, essentially looking at the same thing. And what, just to take away message from this is the short course, we, we compared um, uh, MRIs from short course patients who've been treated at Hopkins with long course patients who were treated at Hopkins. And essentially um, the short course with chemo was associated with about 300% uh, better radiologic response when compared with long course. You know. It, it, it kind of looks kind of funny and all these numbers, but really it's just all the short course that we did, which is what I just showed you, 26 patients. We took another 26 patients that had been treated their traditional way before. Um, and at least we know that there's radiologic evidence. The MR shows that it's better. So it's just, it's not just my, my interpretation of things. This was again, part of our early experience at Hopkins. I think we're up to probably 30, 35 patients that we've watched. We started doing it in 2013. And um, these are patients who have had chemo and radiation, and then the tumor disappears. Um, and that's based on a scope and an MRI. And then what? Um, in our experience, 40% uh, of them came back. And out of those, two had metastasis, you know, disease spread. So is it something that I think I can recommend, on, you know, completely? I, I don't think we know enough about it. I, I think it's, it's not crazy. I think the vast majority of patients do not recur, well, not the vast, over 25% recur. Um, and when they do recur, they recur usually within the vast, the vast majority of them happening in the first year, 13 months in our data. And that's also in the international data that was presented. Um, but the ones that are failing are concerning. And I don't think we have a good understanding of it. Actually at Hopkins, we have a protocol, which one of my colleagues, partners is running. We were doing circulating DNA and trying to see whether that helps us in, in picking some of these occurrences earlier. Um, so if you get approached by our research team, please um, hear them out. And um, this is what it is. The circulating DNA, it's, it's, still, it's, a, it's still somewhat experimental. Uh, it's on offer, we can send you, we can give you a lab request to go get circulating DNA, but we don't really know what it means. So this is not ready for, for um, sort of prime time at this point. Um, so in conclusion, short course appears to be at least as effective as long course. Advantages of giving chemo first, as I mentioned, there is a higher rate of complete clinical response and potential for watchful waiting. And, and then you need to go to the hospital less, especially in the era of COVID. Um, our rectal cancer MDC, our program at Hopkins has been uh, very uh, productive. We have seen a lot more patients with rectal cancer. We feel like we're providing a lot more focused and, and regionalized care and we ourselves are very happy with how things are going, you know, in terms of um, uh, our own program. We would love to grow the research part of it. We would love to have a little bit more data collection, but, um, and, and we're working on that. And um, again, because we all meet all the time, if anybody has a new idea or something, so it's allowed us to really bring in new um, uh, protocols into the treatment of rectal cancer. Um, this is our team. These are all my colleagues and my partners. Um, and, uh, Every one of them really is wonderful. I'd, I'd be happy to have surgery by, by um, any of my partners. And Tam here is definitely keeps us all uh, straight. So uh, with that said, I thank you. And I'm going to turn the uh, discussion on to, uh, to Tam and she will do her presentation and then we can take your questions. Okay. So um, we started the Rectal Multi-D in fall of 2016 and we, um, we 
developed this because we wanted a one day visit for patients to come and see all the experts um, specialized in rectal cancer, which includes surgery, medical and radiation oncology, pathology and radiology. And what we do is we, um, we discuss each patient and we formulate a plan that meets um, the needs of the patients and, and their desires. Um, at Hopkins, we tend to get um, very complex cases, which include patients that have stage four cancers, where the rectal cancer is spread to their liver or their lungs, or again, in their pelvis. Um, and then we also tend, again, get reoccurrences and then rare disease processes. Um, we tend to target um, the younger population, um, so we've been seeing an increase in that number of um, patients, as well as the um, older population. So when a patient comes into our rectal multi-D, we try to um, offer personalized um, treatment. Um, we evaluate each case and determine the needs and desires of each patient. Um, we look at um, what are the needs of the patient and the family to make the process easier. We try to make treatment um, easy for the patient. So if they live out of the um, state, we try to offer um, chemotherapy near their home. Um, if they're going to get the short course radiation, we tend to like them to come to Hopkins for that. Um, but we work closely and collaborate with the local teams to make the treatment process easier. This is again, a picture of um, multiple people on our multi-D team, including the surgeons, um, medical oncology, um, Radi um, radiology um, and pathology. This again is a picture of our surgeons. Um, and then Dr. Safar talked a lot about our advances in treatment options, including the five by five um, radiation, the total knee adjuvant chemo up front, where they get all the chemo up front. We used to sandwich it where they'd have chemo, radiation, then surgery, and then more chemo. But um, during the COVID, um, Ear, we found that doing all the chemotherapy up front um, has been much easier for the patients and they've um, responded well with that. We also offer genetic testing when the patients come to see us. Um, we also, they, it's usually a um, saliva test and then they can do blood tests. And then we also um, can do genetic testing on the tissue from the colonoscopy um, procedures. Um, we also, one of the um, things that we've been working with is if, um, depending on your genetic um, disposition, if you um, are um, a candidate for immunotherapy. So with um, different things that we offer to patients when they come in, especially the younger population, is a fertility clinic. Um, and this is good um, for the patients um, that, you know, um, still um, want to have children. Um, we offer... Um, sperm preservation and um, harvesting of um, eggs. And I'll get into that more. Um, we also offer psychosocial support. We have social workers, we have psychologists that are specialized in um, dealing with people with cancer because um, this is just you know, hard, a hard thing when you get diagnosed with cancer um, for the patient and the, and the families. We, again, we um, offer genetic testing, um, one of the things that we've found that's really important is pelvic um, floor physical therapy. Um, there's um, physical therapists that specialize in um, female and male um, pelvic floor um, strengthening. And we have found that um, a lot of the patients, um, when they're um, undergoing treatment, it's good to get started um, sooner than later to um, work with a physical therapist to strengthen their pelvic floor. Um, also, some of the women with um, radiation, they can get scar tissue and narrowing in their vagina. So the physical therapists work a lot with this population to try to prevent that. We also have a great team of ostomy nurses that are very um, experienced that will work with you, um, be, you know, before surgery to explain um, the process and then work with you throughout the hospitalization and then after surgery. We also encourage homeopathic options. Um, many of my patients um, go to um, you know, doctors that offer um, different homeopathic approaches as, as well as the, um, the treatment plan that we have offered. Um, a lot of my patients get acu acupuncture. They said that it helps um, them during their treatment to decrease their symptoms, and then they continue to get it um, throughout their journey um, you know, after surgery and then you know, um, for years later. Um, another thing that we offer is nutrition consults um, because, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, for patients that are getting chemotherapy um, 
just they don't they have a decreased appetite and we want them to you know um, not to lose too much weight and then we also offer nutrition um, while they're in the hospital and and um, through you know throughout their post-op and survival time um, this is just a um, one of the things um, I when we do, um, developed the multi D group, um, I developed a survivorship group. So we actually meet um, quarterly. And during these meetings, we um, usually have an educational speaker that talks about common topics that patients deal with um, before, during, and after surgery. Again, a lot of the topics have um, related to nutrition, bowel function after surgery, pelvic floor strengthening. We've had a great genetics um, talk by um, Dr. Giardello, who works here, um, and many other topics. So I'm always willing to share those um, PowerPoint pre pre presentations to anybody that may need it. One of the big things that I really um, enjoy is peer mentorship. So anybody that comes into our clinic and wishes to have a um, peer mentorship with a patient that's had the surgery, we, um, I will pair them up with a patient that's pretty similar to their situation. Um, and that has been very successful helping patients um, throughout the process. One of the things that we're working on developing right now is um, a peer mentorship for um, parents of um, patients, especially the younger population, as well as um, peer mentorship for um, significant others. Um, one other thing that um, we do is we're, we do community outreach, trying to you know, um, spread the word to um, the community um, that you know, rectal cancer is being seen um, in the younger population now. Um, so we try to encourage patients um, to get colonoscopies if they have any symptoms, um, which includes rectal bleeding, anemia of unknown reason, um, or other um, symptoms. Um, survivorship fund. So I had um, a patient who um, was a, a, um, had surgery with us who actually has donated money. Um, and it's a fund that we use for patients um, that may struggle if they're coming into town for the radiation treatment and they need help with, um, you know, lodging um, or just other um, potential needs they may have. We also um, give patients survivorship bags um, when they're seen in clinic, which um, includes um, a, a homemade prayer shawl from pa actual patient survivors, as well as some other things that are helpful while um, they're going through this journey. This is um, the, a pamphlet of the um, fertility clinic, and this was um, developed by um, some of the GYN doctors at Hopkins, and it's been really instrumental for patients, um, especially the younger population that still potentially want to have children. Um, it's a really easy step where you just call the number listed here, and um, it's like a checklist of you know, what you're interested in. Um, and they, they've streamlined it very well. So it's um, easy for patients. Um, some of the things is sperm preservation. And then one of the things we like to do if, if the women um, are gonna get radiation, um, we um, move their ovaries um, out of the field of radiation. And then um, they also will work with you for, for egg retrieval um, prior to treatment. Um, if you wanna you know, try to um, conceive later down the road um, or have a surrogate. Um, so that it's just a really nice process here. And um, once the referral goes in, they try to call you with, you know, very soon after. This is a picture, as you all may know, um, of Trey Mancini, um, and he was diagnosed with colon cancer. Um, and he has done a lot of community outreach for, uh, um, for the, um, the area. Um, he was diagnosed with colon cancer and his only symptom, the only thing that um, his symptom was, was fatigue. So he had a sports physical for the Orioles and it was, he was found to be anemic. Um, so he went on to have a colonoscopy and he was found to have um, colon cancer at age 27. So he has really um, been instrumental in um, making sure people get colonoscopies if they have any symptoms um, and encouraging you know, um, the doctors to also um, get colonoscopies sooner than later. This is a picture of a Facebook rectal cancer support group that I developed um, several years ago. And as you can see, we have about 311 members of patients that have been treated at Hopkins, um, you know, various stages throughout the journey. Um, a lot of survivors are on this group and you have to actually be, um, it's a private group. So you have to be asked to um, join, but um, there, it's a great Facebook page for patients. Um, that can talk to other patients and family, um, you know, for um, questions, suggestions, and various other modes of help. 
Um, so now what I'm going to do is we're going to turn it over to any questions um, that you may have and um, just submit the questions and then we'll try to answer them as best as we can. Thank you. Great. So the first question we have are how many specialists would I see in the clinic? I can do that or Tam can do that. We'll, we'll, we'll both do it. I'll tell you this. Um, when we had clinic in real time, patients came here um, to our campus and um, they saw the surgeon and the radiation oncologist. Uh, now we have a dedicated medical oncologist colleague too, so you'll be seeing everybody. Uh, medical oncology, radiation oncology, and surgery. These are the three clinical disciplines that are involved with the management. Sometimes GYN has to be involved, but they don't come right away. Not this, not, not, not on that visit. And um, the others are essentially a discussion. You know, the, radi the radiologists, are, they're there. We discuss the case together. The same with the pathologist, but they, you're not seeing them. So three specialists. And now with, with, with telemedicine and with um, Zoom visits, I really don't know where it's going because I think we've gone down the road of telemedicine, but I think we're actually now going back to seeing patients in, 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 in person. So I anticipate what I just said will, will be the future, you know, in terms of seeing the three specialists that day. One of the things that we are trying to do is um, make it um, accessible to the fertility clinic on the day that you come as well as see a genetic counselor. So they're the two things that we're hoping to include as well. You know, one thing also Tam touched on is the um, Mancini Foundation is we have um, really hopes and interest in it. The colorectal cancer is affecting younger and younger individuals, which we don't know why. And it's very disheartening, obviously, to see young people with the disease. So we are um, hoping and looking for, uh, hoping sponsorship to sort of start a, a, a young colorectal uh, cancer um, center. And again, focusing on all the things that, you know, like from fertility to to um, to um, all these other aspects, you know, um, are, that are involved, genetics, et cetera, et cetera. So we hope to have that going sometime in the near future. Great. Second question is, do you see a lot of ca cases where the rectal cancer has spread to the liver and potentially the lungs? Yeah, we do it, unfortunately, and they each each patient and each scenario is really unique. We um, are pretty aggressive here at Hopkins in going after these spread sites. So even if it's spread to the liver, as long as it's resectable, and again, we we go after a lot of things that probably um, outside centers um, might not. But um, we. Uh, go in with the mindset of curing the patient and hoping to remove the disease. Now, if it's multiple sites, lung and liver, then it might not be a curative situation. But whenever you're treating cancer, you have to separate the, the goals. Either you're dealing with a situation where you'd like to cure or a situation where you'd like to palliate. And palliate means prolonging life or making quality of life better. And if patients present with one or two or a few liver mats that are all in the same spot, we still would like to think of it as a curative paradigm. We'd like to remove all the disease. Obviously there's combination of therapy between chemo and radiation, but we still um, feel like we'd like to treat the patient with a curative intent. Great. Um, we have a, cute, a few questions here around um, COVID and the pandemic. Um, can you elaborate on treatment, if treatment is available prior to receiving the COVID vaccine or post receiving the COVID vaccine? Okay. Yeah. I, I, you know, at this point, the vaccine, obviously we um, would, would love to see everybody get the vaccine. You know, we encourage taking the vaccine, but it's not really part of our, um, uh, treatment nor algorithm of seeing patients or not seeing patients. So, you know, even for us, uh, you know, I'm fully vaccinated, but I still have to follow all the regulations and, 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 and even the visiting policy in the hospital hasn't changed based on vaccination. I'm sure it will come with time, but right now um, it hasn't really affected any of our management paradigms. Okay. We also have a three-part question here. I'll, I'll try and break it up. So the first question is, 
for someone that received treatment, it's LAR treatment back in August, 2019, and then a reversal in March, 2020. And she is wondering why she's not able to digest vegetables, lentils, and fruits, and what effect does removal of the rectum and the colon have on digestion of fiber? Um, first of all, I'd like to ask what it means to not being able to digest fruits. Is the patient seeing fruits, I guess, in, in their in their stool? I don't know what pieces of that in the bowel, but in general, in general speaking, I guess I should have touched on that in my initial presentation. The rectum uh, acts as a reservoir. You know, it acts as a storage area for stool. And then when it distends enough, you get called to, to go to the bathroom, you know, you sort of get an urge to go to the bathroom and you empty. And generally speaking, patients, when before they have these diagnoses of, you know, such as um, that needs radiation and surgery, you go and, you, you know, the rectum gives you a signal and then you go. Some patients go once a day, some patients go two or three times a day, some people go every three or four days. So that's your normal habit. That's fine. When you remove that reservoir, and let's assume we're going to reconnect you, low anterior resection is what it's called, reconnect you. We're bringing colon down to low, or it could be anus. And by doing so, we remove the reservoir and change it. So essentially like you're going from uh, something that's being held in a cup to basically a straw. And that the colon doesn't have the ability to distend like the rectum. So then you have this situation where you get clustering, you go and then you get up and you're like, oh, I'm not empty, you go again. You get up and then, oh, I'm not, I'm not empty, you go again. So this is a classic low anterior sort of symptom or syndrome or outcome. And that doesn't typically have anything to do with digestion. You know, it's just the, the fact that you're connected from colon down to anus, there's nowhere to hold things. But the digestion that most of the food digestion happen in the small intestine. And these surgeries don't typically involve sm small bowel. You know, yes, you might have a temporary stoma that we get rid of um, at some point down the road, but um, Generally speaking, the digestion is not changed. I think what does change is the colon typically is involved with absorbing water from the, from the, from the stool. And then what you used to see as a solid bowel movement, you know, one large one, you have that, that is definitely affected. So you go anyway from three days not going to one day you go like 10 times and you're like in the bathroom and it's very demoralizing. And then you go three days and you're doing well. So um, anyway, that, that, that's a classic outcome, you know, from the clustering to the fragmentation to uh, some of these symptoms. But the actual food digestion, I, am, I think that might be a little bit more to it, which I, I, I'm happy to discuss offline, but, you know, not, not a classic symptom we see. That was a great explanation. Thank you. The second part was, what is the reason behind intense internal and anal canal burning every now and then since experience or since having surgery? Again, many, many reasons can be the cause of this. The burning could be from radiation from what's left. So again, you know, we said we radiate rectums before we take them out a lot of times today. We, if we're not doing a complete removal and a colostomy, we're reconnecting. And whatever we're leaving behind can be to some extent radiated. That's one explanation. The second explanation is if you're going quite a bit of times, that really causes the pelvic floor to sometimes spasm. And I think that's what you uh, can experience, you know, this sort of never really feeling completely empty. It causes some pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, Again, one of the things that we didn't talk about is we have a, historically, I've had a very um, strong pelvic floor team. And my partner, Susan Gearhart, I sent her a couple of patients recently that she's put in uh, stimulators, you know, for patients who have had this low anterior resection. And they see, that seems to help really. In, in more than one fairly common symptoms. Leakage is a symptom that patients have with this when they get connected really low, and the stimulator seems to help with that. It actually also seems to help with the fragmentation and the constipation that comes with it. And, and, and it goes from constipation to go, 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 constipation. So all of that is helped. We don't understand the mechanism because it, you're stimulating the nerve, uh, but it works. And it's the same thing for chronic constipation, same thing for incontinence, for other reasons. So just a few things that if you're struggling with function, 
please reach out and let us know and, and we might have a few things um, to help with. Thank you. Next question is, what kind of innovation is happening in regrowing the rectum and colon? None that I'm aware of. I'm sure there's all sorts of lab work um, and experimentation that's going on in, in, in uh, basic science, but there's nothing coming down the, uh, you know, the pipeline that we have even been introduced to or talked about. Great. Are there any clinical trials available? Uh, many. And it, each scenario, again, is, is, is uh, unique. Uh, many, many trials from the different tumor markers that you have. We have trials going on for MSI high patients, for, you know, for this, for that. Uh, many. I would, again, encourage you to reach out. They're, most of them have been ran through um, the medical oncology group. Um, with the chemo aspect of things. Um, but um, yes, we have many open trials. Thank you. What are some concerns patients have prior to surgery? The, the, the biggest concern I hear from patients is the bowel function. You know, I mean, again, and I think Tam would like for her to, 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 to chime in here a little bit, is that She's been great in connecting patients to other people who have had similar surgery. Um, we try not to just have the person who's had the best outcome talk to you because we don't want to give you like a biased view. It's like everything's going to be rosy. So we try and make it as realistic and as, as, as possible. Um, and obviously the fear of having cancer. I mean, that's always going to, that's always going to be on your mind. Um, but it just sort of, it's a lot to take in when, when you first get diagnosed. I mean, there's radiation, there's chemo, and what is going to happen? Um, and, and in younger patients, especially with the rectal cancer, you know, you're operating in the pelvis. So these are things we didn't really talk about, but these are things that are concerning to, to anybody that comes, you know, some of it is radiation and the surgery can cause sexual dysfunction, inability to get pregnant, you know, many things come into it. Um, and we try our best to, to address each one of those, and, you know, and, 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 um, and take it as a step in a separate approach. I agree. And I feel sometimes too, um, the patients, um, they, they feel very overwhelmed, but they also feel that they're burdening um, their family, um, you know, when it comes to um, the treatment and, and the process they go through. So, you know, they, they deal with a lot of um, psychosocial issues that we usually help them with through the process. That's helpful to hear. Next question is, um, is sarcoidosis in the lungs common in rectal cancer patients and how long after rectal cancer can a patient be treated for sarcoidosis? You know, it's funny. I, I'd never really seen it until recently and I saw it twice. So I know it's not common. And I don't know enough about sarcoidosis to answer that question. But I think the one thing I would take away from this is if patients come with cancer of any sort, rectum, colon, all that, and then they have a lung lesion. Um, it's almost assumed that it's a metastasis from the from the tumor. That's always how the system. I mean, again, this is not one person assuming. It. You know, I think the benefit of coming to a place like Hopkins is you're getting the opinion of about four surgeons, two radiation oncologists, all at once, and then one person comes to present the overall uh, uh, overall picture or overall treatment plan. And um, in 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 any clinical scenario, when things don't add up, it's, it's good to ask questions and figure out what's what. We've had it go both ways. We've had the patients come in and they say, well, this is benign, it's benign, it's benign. And then when you go and take out a little segment or a little, and it ends up being a metastasis. And then we've had it recently go the other way where patients come and they say, well, they have lung metastasis, but then when they go and have a little biopsy or take a seg little segment of it from the lung, it ends up being something else, sarcoidosis, for example. So, um, it's always, I think it's good news. I don't know, you know, that it's got, not gone to the lung and we hope that that makes it much more curable from the rectal cancer standpoint. I really have no comment on the sarcoid in terms of the treatment and how and when. We, we've held off on treatments. That's all I can say to you. Recently, we've said, let's go with the rectal cancer management. When that's settled, then they can go start their um, sarcoid treatment. Thank you. 
which is a few months usually. We have a few questions here around the screening process and tests that are needed prior to getting treatment. Can you expand on what the screening process is and what it entails? Screening for rectal cancer, I'm guessing. Um, screening yeah, in general. Around the screening process prior to finding out they have cancer, but also once they discover they have cancer, what it, what is the type of um, tests that are needed to do, figure out the best. I'm going to let Tam answer the once they have cancer, what she goes through and how she gets the test done. So the first important thing is um, that they get a colonoscopy um, to look at, um, you know, the whole colon. Um, and then if they find a mass, they biopsy it. And then we look to see what the pathology is. Um, and sometimes, most, I would say 80% of the time it's cancer. Sometimes it may be high grade dysplasia that is a, you know, um, an early type of cancer that can, it can turn into cancer. Um, so we always get a colonoscopy and then confirm pathology. After that, then we get a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis to make sure that um, the cancer hasn't spread to the other organs. We also do a rectal MRI, which is an MRI that looks specifically at the rectum and the lymph nodes in the area. And that's really important for us to stage the tumor, figure out what the best treatment process is. Years ago, they used to do something called um, an endoscopic ultrasound, but we found that that is kind of phased out and um, it, the accreditation, um, the national accreditation um, committee, um, they prefer rectal MRIs. Um, and then we also get a CA, which is the um, tumor mark, the blood tumor marker for um, colorectal cancer. And we use that as a baseline um, for all patients. And that's actually a blood test that will follow for up to five years. Um, and then we, we can, like I said, we can do genetic testing on the pathology from the colonoscopy, as well as a saliva um, genetic um, testing kit that they have um, at the hospital. Um, so that's like the basic um, workup that we do. And then after we see the patient, we may do further workup depending on their um, history and the presenting um, problems. Great, thank yeah, you. From a screening standpoint, I mean, I think the, uh, unfortunately the pandemic, I think affected uh, the, the, uh, the overall healthcare situation, if you like, in the country, you know, people who, could put things on something off, they, they put it off and understandably so. Um, so I hope we're not gonna see too many advanced tumors going forward, but in general, the recommendation now is to start screening at the age of 45 for asymptomatic patients. If you have no family history and you have no symptoms, you should go get a colonoscopy at the age of 45. I had one and it's a straightforward procedure. The prep is annoying, yeah, but I mean, I think the peace of mind is important. Um, if you have any symptoms, then no matter what the age is, I think you should go get a colonoscopy. If you, if you see blood in the stool, that it's not hemorrhoids will prove otherwise. Unfortunately, I think you have to look at it the other way. You've got to make sure that there's nothing else causing that bleeding. And, um, and I hope that helps. Yeah. Thank you. Next question is, how will you know if a treatment is working? What, what is the usual significant marker for that? So for rectal cancer, we have, as we mentioned to you earlier, you know, the MR is how we stage it, is how we look at it in the beginning. And it will, they'll, we, we look at it with our radiologist and sometimes it's tricky. You know, sometimes they say it's T3, T2, can't tell. Um, and then there are lymph nodes. And then the scope, you look at it with the scope and there's clearly something in the, in the, in the, in the lumen, in the rectum. You get the chemo radiation and then we scope you and we get the MRI. And I'm gonna talk about the watchful waiting situation. It's gone, you can tell in, in, to your eyes, to the scope, to the scan, everything. And then we end up, depending on the indication, doing serial follow-up of that scenario. So let's say you go down the road of watchful waiting because you've completely responded. You say, okay, well, now what? Um, our protocol has again changed over the last couple of years, the last few years. We did the first one, and so it's kind of, Amazing to see it was 2013. I didn't realize it's been that long, but um, we do MRIs and flexible sigmoidoscopies on you with a, some frequency. It depends on how concerned we are, but the flex sigs are usually three months. We see every three months to see what's, what's happened. And 
MRIs every six months or so, and then it goes to less frequent because the first year is the highest risk of occurrence. I would say it's the same for people who go to surgery. If you went to surgery and you know the way we, we follow the local recurrence is usually a CAT scan, and you're getting those every six months or every year, and then you get a blood test, which is a CEA. It's, the CEA is not a very specific um, tumor marker, uh, but we hope with that sort of research that we're doing with circulating DNA that we would have another tool um, to, to pick things up uh, earlier. Why we wanted to pick things up earlier? Because if we find it and we can take it out, it again gives you a chance at cure. It's not just so we can find things and tell you, oh, well, there's nothing that can be, do, can be done. So there's options, no matter how you, um, whichever way you, whichever direction it goes, there's, you know, so that's why we keep a close eye. Next question is, can I bring a family member with me to my appointments? That, that's a tough one to answer. I'll let Tam also chime in on this, but the policy for visitors at Johns Hopkins has changed almost on a weekly basis. If I saw you today and you did the surgery next week, I couldn't tell you, they'll let you have them. You know, it's based on the positivity rate in the city and what the government tells us or what, this, what, what the governor tells us what we can do. So we've gone back to sort of allowing a visitor at, if you were in the hospital for more than 72 hours to if patients have a critical need to none in the beginning. Uh, I feel like now it's become a little bit more acceptable to have a visitor in clinic with you. Um, we see that all the time now, um, but I cannot say to you that the policy, it, it's, it's it, every few days it gets revisited based again on Baltimore city numbers, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things we can do is when we are in the room seeing the patient, we can um, call the um, significant, significant other and let them listen to the conversation because we find that it's always helpful if another set of ears are listening. Because a lot of times when patients come in, they're so overwhelmed that they really just can't remember much of what's said. So we we do the, do that, and sometimes we'll even FaceTime you if you have a you know phone that allows that. Great. Next question is, how long after surgery can a patient start or, or restart chemo? One month, usually. One month is the minimum, before or after. We'd like you to be off. Other than one specific drug called Avastin, which we probably want to drag out six to eight weeks, again, before and after. Also, are you offering consultations virtually? Are you offering like telemedicine visits? So can you repeat that question? Are you offering consultations virtually through telemedicine? Yes, yes, we are now. I don't know. Again, these things are a moving target. Okay, well, I think that's the last question I have unless there's anything else that you wanted to touch on before we wrap up here. No, um, thank you for your attention. Um, we appreciate you joining our webinar. And um, if you have any questions, uh, you know, please reach out to us. We're happy to call you, discuss with you any other specific questions if you have them. Thank you.